Um, good morning, good afternoon, evening, everybody. Um, my name is Ginny Hendricks, and um, together with Bianca Kramer and Cameron Nalen and uh, a bunch of other uh, metadata fans, uh, we've prepared this session um, to try to bring several conversations together about um, open metadata. Um, a lot of the discussions have been um, prompted by the um, announcement from Microsoft Academic that they're closing down their um, service at the end of the year. Um, so some of the conversations about how we're going to um, achieve more um, richer, more comprehensive and openly available metadata have been accelerated. And so I'm really happy that Force 11 is, is giving us an hour um, which is a bit of a challenge because there's so much to talk about, um, but really happy to do this conversation at Force 11 and bring some of these um, players and conversations together today. Um, this is a photo of where I am sitting right now. This is uh, two phone booths in the Crossref Oxford office, and one is called Meta and one is called Data. And I'm currently sitting in Meta. Um, it was difficult to pick. And Rachel is sitting in Data. Um, and they're kind of the wrong way around unless you turn that way. But I thought it was a good one just to start while we we're waiting. Um, so um, just to kind of set the context, I wanted to remind everybody of um, the talk yesterday from Dr. Shamila Nair Badwell from UNESCO, um, who was talking about their new uh, open science recommendations, which were um, approved and announced uh, a couple of weeks ago. So these are the, the UN sustainable um, development goals. And um, uh, one point she made that really stuck out to me was that open science is increasingly recognized as a critical accelerator for society to achieve all of these 17 goals for society and humanity. And I would like to propose that without open metadata, there is no open science. Um, so that's really the context within which we want to talk about open metadata today. Um, I will uh, very quickly introduce everyone who's going to be involved in um, uh, sharing their thoughts and views, but we're also going to ask in a collaborative uh, discussion document for lots of your votes and, um, uh, and views as well. Um, so as I said, I'm Ginny Hendricks, I'm from Crossref, currently in Oxford in the UK. Uh, Bianca Kramer is at Utrecht University and you'll know her from uh, her work on the the scholarly tools and, um, and a, a lot of the analysis that's coming out at the moment. Same with Cameron Nalen, who's at Koki um, down in Australia. And um, Laura Paglione will be talking about Metadata 2020. Um, uh, she's a consultant leading that. Uh, Katrina McCallum uh, from Hindawi and um, open science uh, advocates, well-known open science advocates, um, will be talking about the um, the lessons learned from campaigns like um, the Initiative for Open Citations and the Initiative for Open Abstracts. Um, Heather Pirwa, you will know from uh, our research from Impact Story and uh, more recently, uh, Alex, uh, which is uh, one of the exciting efforts to um, help the community um, replace uh, or even build on what Microsoft Academic Graph have done before. And Rachel Lamy is from Crossref and she's going to talk about a different kind of approach that isn't a campaign, that isn't scraping or harvesting metadata, but is about community sourced assertions. So a little bit about how we're going to run the session. Um, uh, the first part is uh, what I just described. So uh, some lessons learned, pros and cons and challenges from these different types of um, approaches to gathering open metadata. Bianca is then going to lead us through some data that she's just put together um, and then uh, an interactive session where we will use Mentimeter to um, look at different types of metadata to decide uh, and agree as a group how important they are and how open they are to try to then um, at the end of the session, which Cameron will lead, to um, come up with a plan and try to focus and um, uh, hopefully, uh, potentially under Force 11, be able to continue the discussion, not just to talk, but to create action plans uh, as a group to move forward. Um, if you want to take a note of this uh, URL, the tiny URL, this is the active discussion document. I don't know if someone can just maybe put it in the chat. That would be helpful. I just did. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, and we're going to ask, this is not Zoom events or webinars, it is a normal meeting, I think. So I think everyone should remain muted, but please do raise your hand if you want to um, uh, ask a question. But there is a section in this notes document, the, the discussion document to add questions and all of us uh, that you see on the screen will be jumping in to answer. Um, so we thought we would talk about uh, three different approaches um, to efforts to try to make richer, more comprehensive um, open metadata available. So we're first going to talk about advocacy, which is sort of the persuasion or social, social um, contracts, um, the harvesting or scraping or kind of um, semantic and AI approaches to um, gathering metadata. And then um, a, a more emerging uh, approach, which is around community curation and assertions of metadata. And for each of those, we're going to look at the lessons learned really from these approaches. So what are the pros and cons, the challenges and what each, each um, example is gonna, is gonna try to focus on next, um, hopefully with some coordination between us all. So I will pass on to Laura who, um, yes, I see, hi Laura. So I'm gonna uh, <laughs> run, the, run the slides and uh, Laura is running the Metadata 2020 um, initiative. Thank you. Thanks, Ginny. Um, yeah, so I'm on the persuasion and, um, and advocacy side with Metadata 2020. And Metadata 2020 was conceived in late 2017 with the goal of rallying and supporting the community around the critical issues of open, openly sharing richer metadata for research communication. And we wanted to help metadata champions make the case for greater investment in metadata quality and elevate it to be a strategic priority and not just an oper operational afterthought. So its purpose is rooted in the recognition that open metadata enables functional and critically important benefits like those stated in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which you see here on the slide. From the start, our approach was to develop a new, develop and nurture a broad community of practitioners, supporters, and users of metadata. And these individuals actually defined the work of the initiative and gave it its energy, its passion, and its momentum. But they also set the direction, um, what was worked on and how that work got done. And this approach provided tremendous opportunities for collaboration and ownership over the work, which led to a variety of outputs and deep engagement. And it filled a void in our communities. The outputs are available for everybody's use and um, we've seen a lot of positive developments as a result. Uh, and the approach required participants to negotiate a shared understanding of the problem space and the solutions, something that can be qualitatively rich and beneficial, but it is really difficult to measure. And some understandably wanted more quantifiable results, which the process itself couldn't have couldn't provide. In um, 2021, Metadata 2020 moved into a new phase, and that phase is to encourage the community to move to collective action as part of this you your turn campaign, which we've started. And our goals now are to support, support more targeted teams and help them tie their messages and their work to the global issues like the um, UN SDGs, effectively transitioning Metadata 2020's activities from community understanding to advocacy and action. Oh, Ginny, I think you're muted. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, I was muted. <laughs> um, thank you. That was a really nice, uh, succinct you know, run through of Metadata 2020. Um, now we're going to hear um, from Katrina, who will talk about these um, cross organizational volunteer initiatives, um, which we've called Initiative for Open X. There's a few. Um, hi, everyone, and, and thank you. And um, in, in some ways, in contrast to Metadata 2020, these are really specific. Um, um, campaigns with very specific asks. <clears throat> what was really nice about them is that um, they originated uh, uh, and were researcher led. Um, you know, um, we've got Silvio and, and David Shelton here who are a key part of the Open Citations um, uh, uh, um, initiative. Um, and um, for each of them, we have a chair and a coordinator. Ludo is absolutely championing, championing the, 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 the more recent campaign about abstracts. We also have ways to measure 
um, whether we've got any success and we've had some um, um, great sort of monitoring and tracking and data analytics. And I think Bianca is going to demonstrate what that means when you have a, uh, uh, you know, when you can actually measure what's happening. Um, and that's been a vital part of, of, of actually both campaigns in, in different ways. Of, of, um, so in comparison, the sort of pros and cons. So this was all, it was cross stakeholder, there were publishers, there were researchers, there were other organizations um, um, involved, infrastructure organizations. It was basically a bunch of people who said, can we do something? And can we, can we get it going? And I think I4OC has been a, a really amazing success, but it is now quite old. It's, it's uh, what, 2017, 21, you know, four, five, five years old. Um, and, you know, it was, it was, there was a very clear, simple ask. All you had to do was to email Crossref and ask them to switch your citations, which were already there to open. That still posed a problem for some, for some publishers, but it was a very easy um, to get as well. It was easy to understand why citations are important. It's linked to reward and evaluation. It's linked to, to looking at interactions, collaborations, um, whatever you like. Um, the, the cons of it is, is that it takes up volunteer time. And uh, we were lucky we had, uh, you know, great, group of people. It also did annoy some people, particularly some very large society publishers when researchers independently went and tried to campaign those societies. Um, but we had, I think, demonstrable success. Um, and the most recent uh, report, I think, from Ian Hutchins is that in Crossref of journal articles uh, with references, 92% are available. Um, but importantly, even the huge publishers uh, like Elsevier, um, joined the campaign, um, and that was in spite of the fact that they had a sort of money spinning operation um, um, beside, uh, besides it. Other organizations like a ACS also in, uh, involved. It's still, for some reason, really hard to get triple I, triple E on board and to pick up the long tails, but that's essentially a success. So with the abstracts, it's newer. We were building on the success. Abstracts are freely available anyway. Go to any publisher website, they're free. What's not to love? Surely they can be made uh, available. Um, and we got support from middle-sized publishers. But at launch, crucially at launch for IFOC, we had all the big publishers apart from Elsevier and, and IEEE. We had Wiley, we had Springer Nature, we had Taylor and Francis, all at launch. We didn't have that with abstracts. Uh, essentially, it hits big publishers in the pockets. They sell their, their abstracts when they're, they're aggregated. It was a much quieter launch. It was a harder ask because the uh, publishers, even some open access publishers, weren't actually submitting their abstracts as, uh, as, as metadata to Crossref. And there are some technical issues to get them there. Um, but also we're in an environment where there are a lot more open science asks, and I think abstracts were just not seen as a priority. They were harder to get, they're free anyway. Why would you bother making them available? Um, we've got success, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, middle-sized publishers um, joining us, but we have slightly lost engagement and uh, momentum and you know, partly pandemic. And so how do we, as a campaign, build on the success of I4OC and, and get that message across why it's so fundamentally important? So would it be better for us, for example, to join as one super campaign group? That's one of the questions. Okay, Ginny, apologies, I think I've been too long. No worries, that's great, thank you. Uh, and now we'll look at the, um, the, the harvesting approach from Heather, who's, I think it's uh, 3 a.m. for you, so doubly thanks for participating. You might want to unmute, ask to unmute, there you go. Uh, she, can't, um, she can't unmute herself. You were, a, you were the host. Hang on, make co-host. Yeah, works. Ginny, I think you need to make uh, Heather co-host because I think only you can do it. Sorry, there we go. This. I got it. Hey, okay. everybody. <laughs> Yay. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, open metadata is currently my life uh, this month, so I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Okay, so I'm Heather. I'm from the nonprofit called Our Research. Uh, you might not have heard of our nonprofit, but you've probably heard of some of our products. Uh, we're the people behind Unpaywall and Unsub and Open Alex, which if you haven't heard of Open Alex yet, uh, hopefully you will in the next six months. So the goal of our nonprofit is actually um, to 
fill gaps in open science infrastructure with easy to use tools and uh, data and services. And we do that largely using uh, open metadata, uh, either nicely arranged open metadata already like Crossref or poorly arranged open metadata like in OAI, PMH, harvesting tools, uh, scraping the web and so on. And so the advantages to this approach are that um, we can often do a fast launch because we don't need agreement from people. We don't need publishers to change what they're doing. We don't need people to donate. It, it, it's a very different kind of operation, right? It's just tech. Um, furthermore, it's tech with a small group of tech people. It's not a membership organization where in the, like ORCID where you need to get people to decide to do things, uh, just two or three of us decide and then we do them. So uh, an advantage of this approach as we do it is that um, we can make bold decisions like going open source, for example, uh, and believing we can make a sustainability model and we can design them, the tools um, for devs, by devs. And I think that makes a big difference in um, adoption and adoption of our tools has been quite um, rapid and big, I, I think, for that reason. Some con, and, and so we can design, we can focus on how, what do people need and how do they need it rather than getting the data, which is a different way to, to think about it. Yeah. So some cons of this approach is that it requires the data to be there, right? So until the citations are open, we can't easily um, include citation data and the citations largely are open now and we can and open Alex it's so exciting um and we're um so it's not often not a viable approach until there's a critical mass either of um, persistent identifiers or other things we can get uh, the data accuracy is spotty and it's often spotty in places you wouldn't think so in building open Alex which we'll talk about more later but it's intended to be a um, both a successor to Microsoft Ac Academic Graph and also its own new cool big thing that's better uh, with that launch coming in January. Anyway, a thing I found is that um, ORCIDs and Crossref data from uh, that are coming from publishers, they're often wrong. And it's not Crossref's fault. The publishers are sending the wrong ORCID associated with the wrong author. It's the ORCID for somebody else in the authorship list. Well, okay, so now we need to clean that up. So there's a data accuracy issue that we're out of control of and need to detect and then clean. Um, and then finally, licensing the resulting data set from merging all this together is, shall we say, complicated. So that's another con. Uh, happy to talk more about it all later. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Heather. I feel like because we asked everyone to do two minutes, everyone just spoke really, really quickly. But <laughs> one, one thing I um, uh, really, really appreciated there was um, uh yeah the data has to be there and it has to be accurate and uh one of the challenges that orchid and, and crossref and others are seeing is that you have to go upstream back to the source to correct anything so that leads very nicely yeah <laughs> that leads very nicely onto um this uh sort of uh, i guess a complementary approach to persuasion campaigning and um harvesting uh which is community sourced um metadata completeness and corrections. So Rachel Lamy is now going to talk through this kind of idea. That was the best segue I ever could have had for this. Um, I know. So um, yeah, so we, I, I think for us, it's probably a little bit um, too early to kind of talk about lessons learned on this, um, on this initiative, um, but certainly as and when we do, we will, we will share those out. Um, it, you know, at Crossref, we've we've long been talking about the idea of supplementing our metadata using additional sources, um, and we already do things like, as you know, citation matching and funder matching to the the metadata that that we receive. But we know, um, as Heather said, there are areas where the um, that there we get a lot of um, emails and and contacts about sort of metadata quality complaints. Those matches with orchids. Um, uh, which, you know, which, which is said that that then needs to be unpicked at the publisher end and, and things that we would, you know, that, that we don't have the power to be able to, to change on behalf of authors. And so, you know, sometimes that the, the process is a little bit, um, it's not transparent because we, we will email the contact we have at the publisher. Sometimes things get updated, sometimes they don't. And, and we'd, we'd like to make that more, more transparent and potentially easier for publishers to be able to, you know, accept those changes to metadata. 
And we relatedly, we also know there are areas of metadata that just aren't complete. Um, a big one is information on retractions and other updates. So I think I had a look the other day and we could see, you know, very roughly over 17,000 items with retraction in our metadata, but we only have just over 1,600 retractions reflected in our crossmark metadata, which is the, the, the section of our schema that we use to capture that. Obviously, there are things also like items claimed in an ORCID record that aren't reflected in the, the metadata that we have, and things like subject classifications that we don't even, you know, that we don't even collect yet. And as I said, obviously, Heather and her team and other similar initiatives are, are doing great stuff there. Um, so we're investing a lab stroke research and development project in collaboration with Jody Schneider at UIUC. Um, BioArchive and the Cochrane Crowd platform to try to look at discrete sections of the Crossref metadata and take a community sourced approach to identifying, correcting and supplementing the metadata. Um, Cochrane Crowd is, um, it's, um, it's a platform or an interface where a crowd go in and look at, um, they're sort of trained up, they look at sections of metadata and, um, and articles and go in and um, sort of augment that. So say identifying things that are potentially a randomized control trial when that hasn't been marked up. So the idea would be to, to try to do this for something like um, retractions and create a mechanism, as I said, for publishers to improve the addition of other information to their metadata. And that would sit alongside other changes and improvements to, to Crossmark we'd like to make. Um, and it might even serve to give publishers information on how to improve their own processes. And um, that's really key. We're always want to, going to want to get the information from our members as a preference, but it could help with things like populating back file information where back files where information can be spottier. And that's why things like asserting where information comes from in our metadata is key. We don't want to be adding inaccurate metadata and we want to show clear provenance so that any metadata users could pick and choose the sets of information they want to use. So, as I said, it's a labs project, really early days. We're lining up some validation exercises to run early in 2022. And if those show promise, then we'd look at how to expand those into a more complete research project proof of concept. We'd love to move to a more automated approach to identifying where information is missing. So, yeah, more to, more to come. Looking forward to the discussion. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we're about a third, just over a third of the way through the session, and it is a, a multitasking session. So again, a reminder of this uh, uh, discussion document, please. Uh, we know there's lots of questions about all of these approaches. So um, the, the representatives are staying on and they're going to be able to answer questions in there. And we also really want to encourage, these are just some examples. There's plenty of other initiatives um, very, very keen to participate, like Open Air, Open Citations, Koki, uh, Data Sight, uh, so many um, invested in this area. So add thoughts, statements, pros and cons, and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, while uh, we are um, adding to that document, uh, we're going to hear now from Bianca about recent um, analysis that shows perhaps what metadata is still missing. So do you want to take over? Uh, yes, I'll take over the I'll take over the screen sharing because there's quite a bit of animation. So do you now all see a big white empty screen? Yes. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll show some data on that uh, big white empty screen because uh, one of the beauties of having all these initiatives contributing to open metadata is that also all these data are available for a very easy analysis without having to be encumbered by um, by paywalls or by limitations to those data. So that's actually already one use case of these open metadata. And I'm very happy to be doing some of that together with uh, with Cameron at, uh, at Koki at Curtin, where, uh, where a lot of these open metadata are ingested and then it allows comparisons like this. We've done this before for Microsoft Academic and now very happy with uh, with OpenAlex, uh, the first iterations of OpenAlex being available, that we could ingest that and we do this analysis and really also show that indeed it is at the moment a very accurate um, 
replacement or uh, it very accurately replaces Mac at the moment. I understood from Heather that come January, this, uh, there will be additional things in there. This is really a representation of the current, the first data set that was, that was shared. And uh, what you could see here is that um, it, for a large part, overlaps with uh, COSREF. For, so for a lot of COSREF records, OpenAlex has records with potentially additional metadata that can enrich COSREF data. At the same time, there's also a lot in OpenAlex that is not currently in COSREF. So that's an additional source of information. And I want to dive into some um, some parts of this uh, of this whole corpus to dive a little bit deeper and show you some of the things that are there and that are perhaps not there yet. And the first one is about this overlap between COSREF and OpenAlex. So what can we see about the added value of OpenAlex metadata to what's currently in COSREF? And this shows that added value for affiliations. So for the different publication types in COSREF, the coverage of affiliation data in COSREF itself, which are the blue bars, and then the added value of what's currently in OpenAlex. So you can both see that there's very clearly added value, additional information, and also that there's still also quite a bit missing because these bars are not going up to 100%. So there is information that's not yet captured by either COSREF or OpenAlex. And the same for abstracts, and you can do that for a lot of different types of metadata. I'm just partial to abstracts, and it's a nice opportunity to also uh, call out preprint servers for doing a really good job on providing abstracts to COSREF. So, yay! The second part is interesting is what's in this part that is in OpenAlex currently and that's not in COSREF, because that's additional publications, additional material that might also be quite interesting to have those metadata on. And um, currently, and that was exactly the same in Microsoft Academic, a large part of it does not have a, a document type. So we don't know yet what it is, but it might be quite interesting to, uh, to dive into that. There's also quite some journal material that's, uh, that doesn't have a DOI. And also more the other publications type like thesis is quite a uh, considerable chunks. Books, repository material, that's all non-DOR material that we now do have interesting, very interesting metadata on. And of course, there's a lot more types of material. For instance, the patents that used to be in Mac that's not in OpenAlex is an example of a completely different type of information that might also be, can also be very useful to have metadata on. So there's a lot out there, also outside of what's, what's in CrossF currently. And then there's this bit, the non crosshef DOIs, uh, part of those are in OpenAlex. I had a discussion with Ginny before that, and we also talked about uh, that there's a lot more non crosshef DOIs uh, that are currently not yet captured. All the, a lot of the Chinese uh, and Japanese um, DOI registers, for instance. But these are also quite interesting to look at. And I'm pulling out here some data from uh, Ted Haberman from two years ago, who looked at data sites metadata and also showing that there's quite a variety in the types of metadata how well they are covered in uh, in this sample of he took 100 records from each data site data center and across that whole sample um, it's not surprising that the mandatory metadata are very well covered which are on the in this quadrant but the non-mandatory metadata coverage is really either very low or for abstract really spotty like only about halfway. So that gives a picture of metadata uh, coverage and quality for non COSREF DOIs. So just some examples of what these open data can show you about metadata coverage. And it's important to know that it's not just about the numbers, not just about these overall numbers, but also interesting to see, okay, if affiliations data are there, but not for everything, is there a bias in what's there? Is there a bias in type of journals? We've seen before that the Diamond Open Access journals, for instance, have less well affiliation coverage than APC-based journals. Is there a difference between countries and languages? So you can also really drill down on that. And there were also targets, different areas where perhaps additional effort is needed to get those, those metadata or to encourage publishers to supply these metadata. 
there's obviously obviously a lot more to be said about this, but uh, I'll leave it as this, just a few glimpses of, uh, of current states of availability of, of metadata. Because this brings us to what we would like to hear from you about at this moment. Um, we made a Mentipol, the, the code is at the top of the screen and it's also at the top of the collaborative document and perhaps someone can also put it in the chat. Uh, what we're asking in what we would like to ask in this metadata poll is really your opinion and your estimates about a number of different types of metadata. You can see them here on the on the right hand side. To what extent uh, you consider them important to have open information about these, these types of metadata and also to what extent um, your estimation to what extent they're currently already openly available. So what this Mentipol will look for you when you open it, you will have for each of these types of metadata, a sliding scale from zero to five to indicate your estimation of how open it is currently and your opinion of how important it is. You can scroll down this list. Uh, you can also skip anyone that uh, you just don't know or just want to skip. So we're gonna give a few minutes uh, for you to um, to fill in this poll and then we'll discuss the results. Of course, we had to make choices of what to include here. If there's anything else you think is important, if you have some opinions about also, for instance, material publication types that you think are really important, uh, the place for that is also in the collaborative document. There's a place to, uh, to add those, those remarks in this section of the, of the presentation. So while you do that, I'm going to change the screen to show the to start showing the live results. And yes, we're biasing the, the process here, but it's nice to have something to look at when you're done. I see nothing's in the least important quadrant. No, that's... <laughs> That's really beautiful. I didn't know you could do that on a Mentimeter. It's that's nice, fantastic. Eh? That's just yeah. lovely to look at the variance. So yeah, when you look at the individual variants, there, wow. there are some. Yeah. It's a bit yeah. more. How much, do you, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. How much do you think it's related to how obvious the importance is? I mean, they're all important at one level, but some people, if you, if you haven't thought about, uh, you know, it's like abstracts and citations. Citations are really obviously obvious. People think, well, abstracts. It's not obvious, but actually, when you when you drill down, they're really important. Just I'm just trying to bias that yeah. particular vote at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're part because you're partial to abstracts. Like I'm me. partial. I'm partial yeah. to I think it's if everyone's are answering what's most important to me and my work or um, my analysis of my research, then which I hope, um, then hopefully we're learning. You know, if maybe, I mean some things that you know you might think are important maybe isn't isn't for other people 
Um, I think it is. Where, a, I guess the persuasion comes in, the campaigning. Um, I, I think it is a great point. I just want to plug that abstracts, for example, really help to assign concepts and topics to a work. And that isn't necessarily clear, um, but them just being freely available, distributed on the web, that lets people read them, but doesn't let someone centrally um, assign um, different um, uh, topics or use them for recommendations or so on. So just want to give a plus one with a practical <laughs> shout out to someone who's trying to do that right now. Yep. There's a space in the um, discussion document as well. If, if um, elements that aren't listed here as part of these 10 are very important to you, then please make, make that case in the discussion document. Someone can add the link again, maybe. So the ones on over um, to the top left um, that are seen as least open available and most important, are, it looks like nine retractions and withdrawals and corrections and things. Is, uh, is, there, is that the right interpretation, do you think? Like that's coming out as something to really focus on, least, least open, but, but seen as very, very important. Yeah, I would think it's definitely a sign that people do think this is uh, this is important, and it's also something that's not currently very well captured in metadata. So, absolutely. And oh, what? 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 Well, I'm glad you all saw that very nice distribution of individual points because apparently now it's not there anymore. That's too bad, but we will share the results later and I'll try to, uh, to retrieve those and then we can also show the, share those individual, uh, individual points. Um, yeah, perhaps on those, on those retractions, it might be nice also to hear from someone, perhaps in the audience who has a strong opinion mm. on those. Just raise your hand if you want to say something about it, perhaps also with some ideas on how to capture that, because these are the ones that are um, currently less well available as metadata. So also, also some ideas on how to go about that. And Ginny, I would really depend on you to, uh, All right. to We've got give people the, to unmute people for that. Jennifer, Jennifer Wright, so I'm going to ask you to unmute. Add your thoughts. Hi, yeah, this is really fascinating. I've actually got a um, poster in the next session on a withdrawal template for preprints. So looking at how we can standardize collection of information about withdrawals, like in terms of causes, effects and impact on, on the research with the aim of that subsequently being used to improve metadata capture. So, so it's really interesting to see that one up there in that corner. Mm -hmm. And I see Todd also. Yeah. Todd Carpenter. Hello. Um, just with regard to uh, retractions and withdrawals, uh, Bianca, I think you're right that it's not that that's not open. It's that a lot of publishers aren't um, capturing that information in metadata. And NISO has begun a project in partnership with Jody Schneider, who spoke yesterday about the Risers project to help publishers improve the quality and the distribution of that metadata. Yeah, yeah that's really great. I think that's uh, very promising. Yeah, I think if I can, it, it sort of feels like, is it very positive that they said there's sort of a range of initiatives in and around this. Um, Maria, obviously we'd seen the, you know, the, the work that, um, 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 that Europe PMC and Emily BI are doing around sort of the, the, the preprints angle as well, which is um, sort of why we wanted input from um, um, certainly at this stage from, from the folks at BioArchive and MedArchive that Cochrane use extensively at this point. But as you said, I think that it is one of those things. There's, there's the advocacy angle, which obviously um, like Katrina um, talked about, talked, you know, 
talked about so eloquently there are you know there are things that we're thinking about in in crossref in terms of like how we collect that information how we advocate for it how we make it easier for our for our members to do it but as you said like we could we'd love to be a better source of open information on on retractions and withdrawals and then you know folks can use that information to be able to to make those links and and to kind of you know to, to sort of make those make those assertions using that information because we just know that it's the information maybe either isn't fully open or is just it's just incomplete at this time and the downstream effects of folks citing um and using retracted works is something Jodie's spoken about extensively so um I, I think that's my I think that's my two cents in um in in, in favor I'm partial I'm partial to retraction information <laughs> there's some um the chat in the in the zoom chat about subject fields as well and a comment as well about like how how important some of these things are to um research on research at scale kind of an analyzing the trends in scholarly research versus what are important to end users you know for individual smaller scale projects i think that's a good point we're probably closer to the larger scale analysis side side of things yeah and i think the subjects and perhaps that's also uh for heather i would like to hear your opinion on that for the subjects to what extent uh it would be so well the way to to assign those subjects and to what extent they are dependent on abstract availability or even better on on full text availability and the complications on that yeah it's a great question and i think we really owe a debt to microsoft academic graph for doing a bunch of work in developing a subject taxonomy and applying it to so many hundreds of millions of papers and then making that data open because it gives us a really of course they didn't do it perfectly but they did do it and it's pretty good and it's better than other things we've got i think and um it makes a really rich training set for um continuing to do that in the future now microsoft did have access to more abstracts than we've currently got and abstracts certainly help. Um, and then there's a lot of other things that can help, like citations and so on. Um, for what it's worth, Open Alex, we have put a lot of work into the subject classification. Uh, so that will roll out, but um, it will be something that continues to get better over the years, I think. Um, both the subject um, taxonomy itself as well as applying it. Yeah. Thanks. Julia, yeah. I see your hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was wondering if we could use the funding information, which is normally linked to subject, to do that. You mean the funding, if, if it's detailed funding information on the type of project or or just at the level of funder? So that might depend on the when, funder. Yeah, most funders have different uh, type of grants, which are linked to different taxonomies of subjects. Yeah, yeah funders will have different programs, won't they, for different areas of, of yeah. um, research to support, but they'll all they'll all use different different program categories probably. Yeah. Also, I think it's wish not you. very well, um, it's not very, I wish, it's a great idea, um, but I think that unfortunately funder grant IDs and so on programs are not very well linked to papers right now in a centrally accessible way. Yeah. Um, if they were, it would really help. Yeah, and I know for, for a subset, and uh, Paolo Mangi from OpenAir could not be here this morning, but I know that's something that OpenAir is trying to do really well, uh, because they are closely linked to European funding, at least for the European funding, that information is there. And I know that from there, you can indeed use that project information to also do a subject uh, classification. But indeed, to do that at a larger scale uh, for a larger variety of funders is, of course, quite complicated. So I think also looking at the time and looking at sort of through my uh, 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 from a distance to that graph, I think a couple of a couple of things stand out to me. First of all, that we collectively think that everything is important, and I think rightly so. But it's hard on this scale to uh, to really say things that are considered less important. So perhaps everything is really important. Um, there are a couple of things that are currently 
less well openly available or less well available at all. That that would be interesting to to discuss how we could make that better available. But even the ones that are considered to be well openly available, like the authors, we heard from Heather before that even that author information is still at least there's a quality issue there. And I think also having author information or having reliable author IDs is a step mm -hmm. further. So even there, I think there's still quite a bit of uh, room for improvement, which may lead as a segue to the to the last part of this uh, of this session. How what next steps could be done with the different approaches out there, be there persuasion uh, to supply those metadata or harvesting approaches to these metadata or more community curation to those metadata with a lot of different initiatives out there, each really contributing very important things uh, to this ecosystem of open metadata. What next step can we take to, um, to improve the efficiency and the outcome and the quality of open metadata? And for that, I would like to give the floor to Cameron to lead this next part of this session section. And I will yep. also yep. stop sharing so we can all see each other. And I brought, oh, okay, well, that, that, yes, I guess the slide itself is not that exciting. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, so all we've got to do now is solve these problems. Um, <laughs> and and um, part of the exercise here was definitely not to um, talk at people or simply you know, dictate what the solutions might look like. Um, but also to really try and energize people um, to think about how we can solve some of these problems. It was a conversation not unlike this, out of which Metadata 2020 grew some years ago. It was a conversation not unlike this that the Initiative for Open Citations grew out of. And indeed, it's a conversation perhaps not unlike this um, that our research grew out of um many many years ago that we probably don't want to think about how long ago that was now um some of us at least um so what can we do to take this forward um that process has identified some priorities um some things that are, that are more important and perhaps even more importantly a discussion about where we don't agree necessarily completely on those priorities um taking this forward is probably going to be multi-pronged um, it's going to involve a bunch of, of different things going forward. So I guess um, question one, um, and again, please take notes or make notes in that document um, because we're not going to have time to talk to everyone or even track what's going on in the chat at a high speed. Um, but is there a sense, particularly those priorities that um, Bianca was just identifying, um, is there a critical mass in the room interested to push on that. I think that particular, that issue of the intersection between authored metadata, the quality of orchids coming from publishers through Crossref, the challenges that Heather talked about, is that, is that something that um, there's a group of people in the room uh, interested in, in taking on and working on? Who feels passionate about that? Use, you can use your hands or... Who wants, who, who feels passionate that someone else should do something about it? <laughs> because that's kind of where we are at the moment. Um, I mean, if none of this is going to happen unless we collectively um, move on it. Yeah. I think this is one of the things that all of the, the three different approaches that we saw examples of all talked about, you know, time, uh, volunteer, um focus getting you know getting buy-in um and i think that's when when we put efforts into individual um uh, goals or specific metadata elements we have seen some success like with um, the initiative for open citation so if we could agree on one area um you know i think we have to we have to we have to join them all together in in my view um and i think whilst we've got things that talk about the sustainable development goals and you know we're all here because we believe open metadata is important all of those things that chart showed showed that we all agree that um one of the other things that came through for me is that um especially from what katrina said is that the initiative for opens um picked things that were an, a simple and easy ask. 
So not, what we didn't include on that Mentimeter thing was not just is, how important is it and how open is it, but how easy could it be for the curators of that metadata element to um, get together and, um, and provide it openly. So I think that maybe that's something to focus on is out, out of all of the elements we've talked about and the additional ones that have been put in the chat, which ones would be almost um, simpler to solve? I think we've all just seen subjects, not simple. Um, would retractions, for example, be something we could all, um, you know, build a campaign around? We've got retraction watch, we've got some, some cross-ref data, we've got other, other sources. Um, so that might be one where I would perhaps hang my hat next. Katrina, yeah, you're unmuted, I think. Can, can I just add to that? Because I, so, so I think uh, simple and doable and understandable is really important if it's to work. Um, the other thing about volunteer time and doing separate campaigns is that it splits all the volunteer time up. And, and so if, we, if, we, if, if somehow we, uh, if we're a community, we can, we can work together to provide very consistent and powerful messages so Heather gave a wonderful example about why she needs abstracts, and that's really important. Most and, and researchers are just not, you know, what, researchers probably have just no idea about what abstracts might be used for, other than to read them on PubMed or something. And 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 um, so it, it's uh, it's. Uh, and I also think if, if we can get together around some kind of consistent uh, messaging for why these things are vital, we will also. Uh, potentially get the attention of government and funders and links to the sustainable development goals in a way that could provide funding and reduce the need for volunteer time to drive this infrastructure, open infrastructure approach forward. Um, so that, that's one I, thing. Can I offer sort of a, a counter, slight counter to that, which is the other aspect of volunteer work is that people don't do stuff they're not interested in and don't care about. Um, so finding things, finding those those sets of things that are, that people do really care about, um, and trying to create critical mass, and then I think to Katrina's point, coordinating, um, uh, trying to find the resource, and resource is a real issue um, to coordinate amongst activities um, would be really key. I was interested, so this you know I can <laughs> got a bunch of people in the chat who really do care about subject classifications, even though it is a hard problem. Um, and we've probably got a bunch of other people who are less concerned about that. But actually, the two things are connected: the abstracts, the retractions, all of this, um, all of these are, are interrelated. Um, there is a suggestion, um, and uh, some of us have been in various other groups um, for the purpose of pulling together. Um, yes, another discussion group. Yes, another forum. Um, but nonetheless, trying to find a way to coordinate amongst some of these activities. Um, is that something that people feel that it would be worth engaging? You've come to this session, right? I mean, if we're asking people to come to a session like this to talk about the problems once every quarter rather than once a year, is that something people feel is worth their time? Um, just to keep talking about what these different initiatives are and where they are. Um, is that a useful thing? Can we take a yes in the can, chat? Can we do a poll? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, I like that people are, are, are putting in almost like a sort of um, a statement into the chat. I am passionate about working on initiative for open blank. Um, and maybe if we can gather those, then we've got our kind of um, you know, by saying the words, I'm passionate about working on it. Um, you know, we're going to get the people that, draw that together. Um, Stephanie, I, I know we've we moved on from what I saw your hand go up, and then I kept talking. Yeah. I'm sorry, but um, do you want to jump in? Yes, I, I just really uh, just want to you know reiterate what I said in the uh, comments. So my group has been thinking about classification uh, quite a bit in the last year or so. And it was a very practical problem because we're working on research uh, and data citations at the moment, and we're stuck in going anywhere forward because we don't know what the data is on. And we know we should be not comparing data sets across disciplines, right? Because they can be so different. Um, so then we started thinking about why not think about, you know, an open classification system for Skullcom? <laughs> 
And I know it's a hard problem, very hard problem, and it's also a huge problem. But I think the people in on this call today are the right ones to solve it. And uh, I just want to put out there that I would be willing to lead and, and look for resources. So <laughs> um, I, I know it's not something we're going to solve, you know, in the next couple of months, but maybe we can use the Google Doc as a starting point. I, um, I would put in, you know, a couple of comments, but then really just to to get people's maybe emails, just that I could start following up. So if you're interested in that, maybe I'll just, you know, put a comment and add your information and then I would reach out and, uh, well, early next year, I would say, if people want to do that. <laughs> yep, you've got, you've, got, you've got my interest and I think a few other nods and, and, and other heads going on. So, um, and we have our first volunteer. So. So we have we 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 have an initiative for open open subject classifications, um, and so who else is anyone else? Um, you're actually really. Are you sorry? I can't I can't track the chat because it's moving so fast at this point. Um, but did we did we get someone who really cares about the author and orchid classification issue? Was that one of the things that came up or? Um, is that just a thing that people want to keep focusing on, addressing, figuring out? Yep, Katrina. I'm just going to say, so things like orchid, that you know, there's a lot of momentum there anyway, but there's still a lot to be done. Same with same with raw, and so so for things like that, they're sort of slightly in a different stage of the campaign. I mean, what's really important for raw now is to get every submission platform, every publisher, every it integrated everywhere. Um, uh, and that's not happening. So that they're slightly, they're at a different stage. The other thing um, I just wanted to flag, um, for example, around um, retractions, is that there will be things coming down the line that are going to be really important, like whether a preprint or an, uh, uh, a journal article is peer reviewed um, and, and to what extent, and that's gonna form part of the metadata. And there's, there's gonna be a whole bunch of stuff, I think around research integrity that's gonna come down the line uh, as well. And I don't know whether we need to, start to think about those things that we might need also in the future, um, as, as well as the things that are happening now and the stages that those particular um, issues are at. Yeah, I think there are there are a lot of issues. So I know that there is there is an interest in trying to find a way to, I know we've talked about this a lot in the past, do better coordination across these efforts. Um, I will, you know, again, subject to something I care about because we have the same problems that Stephanie just talked about and that that's actually connected with all of these things. Um, and the drivers the drivers for adoption of better, better data upstream are very frequently dependent on those subject classifications, it turns out, is the thing we found recently. Um, so, but I think in any case, I think, um, please continue to use the document. Um, we've come to the end of our, of our available time, so I'm gonna pass back to Ginny. Um, but, Please bear in mind that question. Is there something that was on that many meter thing that you really care about that you're willing to do as much as stick up a call, grab some email addresses and bring some people together? And then I think the organizers will be happy to try and coordinate across those efforts in the first instance as a way to move forward. But back to you, Ginny. Absolutely, thank you so much. This timing has been amazing, Those so much. Uh, preparation on all the data and the thinking from the examples and really um, so much energy and um, uh, ideas and enthusiasm in the chat, which I know is really um, no, no mean feat these days when everyone's got sort of challenges, life challenges to deal with um, and a million Zooms uh, to choose between. So I just really want to thank everybody who's helped prepare for the session, but also um, you know, the 90 people, I think, in the end, who have uh, just taken an hour out of their days to come and contribute experiences and thoughts and ideas. And, and we're going to keep that, that discussion document live. There are two sections at the end um, to add, if you want to lead or join a session on initiative for open something, we've got a lot of interest for the subject classifications, as, as Cameron said. And then underneath that, add your name if you want um, to be generally involved in trying to coordinate all of these uh, initiatives. And if we can, as Katrina said, kind of um, share uh, approaches and um, save, save a little bit of volunteer work, um, that, would be, that would be appreciated by all of us who do so much um, and all of you, of course. So 
Uh, that takes us up to the hour. And um, yeah, doubly, thanks again. Enjoy the rest of uh, Force 11.